someone who bases everything on reason has faith in the reasoning process. What's wrong with saying that? Because Why can't you I, say, I have confidence in reason, I have faith in reason, I trust in the reasoning process? You won't say that because it will reveal that both our positions are faith positions. If you ask me why I believe in the Bible and I flip open the Bible and show you a verse, you say you're appealing to what you need to prove. If I ask you why do you believe in reason and give well, me a reason, I'll tell you, then well, you open uh, your you please. open your book, no, you I, open the reason and yeah, you give me a reason. No, no, you, you again, you're making a huge leap. I say, I say that the Bible, like the Quran and like the Torah, is man-made, not God-made. It's a, it's a, it's a human-made literary accretion, full of plagiarism, contradiction, fragmentation, and so on. It's like every other book ever written. And I wrote There's nothing divine about it, and the, the appeal to, to it saying, I can trump anything you say because here's God's word on the page, is a contemptible way of arguing. I, I wrote a logic textbook. Does that make logic man-made? Uh, logic is man-made, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So logic, is, so there's no reason to follow it then? No. If, there's, if I reject the Bible because it's man-made. Philosophy, philosophy, logic, logic is the attempt by humans to make sense. It isn't, it, isn't, it isn't a divine endowment that we possess. Same with philosophy. Philosophy means the love of wisdom. We don't say it's the revelation by... You say what you have is revealed. Now, here's the way of clarifying the difference between us somebody asked earlier. I don't claim to know more than I can. Everything I've said this evening, I've backed by assertions evidence argument. Douglas Wilson, who's just as modest and friendly and tender a chap as I am, says, yeah, but I have an advantage over Christopher, because I know what God wants, and I know what he says in his book. I have access to a higher authority. Now, what I want you, I'll ask him, but I, I don't care. I've asked him before. You have to ask him. How does he know that? And by what right does he claim to know the mind of of God. And if you were a serious spiritual person, wouldn't you think it was a bit much that someone said? They could come before you and tell you what God wanted? As long as they don't call it modesty, I don't mind. As long as they don't call it humility, I don't mind. But I don't like being told that my arguments aren't as good as his because he has uh, divine information that's withheld from me. Now, first of all, it's the same God, okay? God of Islam and God of the Old Testament. It's the same. Allah is the same as the God of the Old It's the same. So hold that aside for the moment. Hold that aside. What he did not know is that of all stars that have names, two-thirds of them have Arabic star names, okay? Now, I don't think that's the point he wanted to make. I think he... he he, he, he didn't quite get that. And so, he, you know, here they go. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Not all stars have names, but two-thirds of those that do have names have Arabic names. There we go. Okay? There they go. And you might say, well, how did this come to pass? What, where did that come from? What was going on? Because if you think of the Middle East now, and it's not where, you're not saying, hey, these are folks naming stars. You go back a thousand years, Islam, 800 to 1100. In that period, which is generally called the golden age of Islam, of Islamic science, golden age, true, go there was no greater golden age in the history of the world before or after. When you look at the some of advances that came out of that period in Baghdad. Algebra was invented in that period. Algebra is itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Our numerals are Arabic numerals. You ever wonder why? You ever stop and think why they're called Arabic numerals? In that period, mathematics took great leaps and bounds. Agriculture, engineering, medicine, navigation, navigation navigation. Star maps were made to assist navigation. Astrolabes were, create, were crafted. Then it all stopped. It ended. It ended. If you're a historian, typically you, are, you're, you, are, you focus on history as marked by changes of kings and leaders and wars. 
That's the lens through which many historians look at the past. And so if you ask people, they'll say, oh, the Mongols sacked Baghdad, and so that's why it all ended. If that were the only force operating, then later, when the Islamic culture rose, you would still see this tradition of scientific um, uh, uh, innovation. But it has not recovered. It has not come back at all compared to what was going on in that 300 years. And what you do is you, you read the writings of al-Ghazali, who is a, a Muslim cleric, and he, he was to Islam what St. Augustine was to Christianity. What he did was he taught you how to be a good Muslim. He taught you how to read the Quran and how to obey the commands. That, because back then, people were just interpreting it for themselves. He came along, he was a, an academic scholar. He interpreted the Quran. He said, this is how you must do it. First has social influence and then political and cultural influence. And basically, his interpretation took over. And in that interpretation, it included the perspective that the manipulation of numbers is the work of the devil. This cuts the kneecaps out of any mathematical advances that would unfold. Math is the language of the universe. If you take that out of your personal equation, you no longer contribute to the advance of human understanding of that universe. And that absence of Muslim presence in the frontier of science persists to this day. Take a look at the Nobel Prize from 1900 to 2010. I can do this, do this for the, for the Jews, for example. How many Jews in the world? There's like 15 million tops, tops, 15 million out of 7 billion people. These are the numbers of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize in the sciences. 25% of the Nobel Prizes. We have a Jewish person in the audience, congratulations, okay, <laughs> fine, okay. <laughs> this is rightly something to be extraordinarily proud of. The traditions of Jews in the 20th century is one of, of education and scholarship. Uh, in earlier centuries, it was one of very strict sort of uh, um, uh, study of the Torah, did not involve the natural world. This was a later emergence of the Jewish culture to exhibit this. Let's look at the numbers for Islam. So these are Jews. There are 15 million Jews, 25% of the Nobel Prizes. There is 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. These are the numbers. Two and a half. Okay, I'll give you three if you really want to include economics as a full number there, okay? <laughs> if you got to give it a full number, okay, I'll, okay. <laughs> now, for me, by the way, you can analyze this in any number of ways. There are 50 times the number of Nobel Prizes, 180th the population, there's 4,000 times the impact. I lose sleep at night with the question, how many secrets of the universe lay undiscovered because 1.3 billion people who in an ancestral time would have participated in this enterprise and are now not. I'm arguing for a certain kind of intolerance. There's, there's no way around that. But it's not the kind of intolerance that gave us the gulag or that would put people in prison for their religious beliefs. I'm arguing for just new rules of conversation. We can call it conversational intolerance, where you know, if I came on your show and said the Holocaust never happened, I would immediately feel pressure from you to, to justify that claim, or you would marginalize me immediately as someone who just could not be trusted, uh, at least on European history. But if I come on your show and say that I'm in dialogue with the creator of the universe, or if I know a cracker literally becomes the body of Jesus, if you say the right Latin words over it, you have to give me a pass. It's taboo to criticize that, and that's really what I'm challenging in my book. Well, there's, there's not sufficient evidence for, certainly not for a personal God, uh, and certainly there's no evidence that he wrote any of our books. Uh, and, and, and we have to realize that we are in a situation where people are flying planes into our buildings because they think God wrote their book, and that they're going to get to paradise by dying in the right circumstances. And it seems to me a, a point of, of really exquisite obviousness that the response to this situation cannot be, 
sorry guys, God wrote our book and you are, you're going to hell for your actions. You know, I get letters every day that I never got before. And those letters are from kids around the world and also from people in small towns who tell me, and I'm just so happy I saw this or I saw the unbelievers or I read your book because I realize I'm not a bad person for asking these questions. I'm not evil. And that is to me something I really hadn't appreciated before, that religion has usurped this notion of morality. So that if you just say, just saying, you know, I don't buy it, automatically is equivalent to the saying, I'm not a good person. And that to me is the underlying most immoral aspect of religion. It is, is it, it tries to have a monopoly on morality and ethics. What it does is it, is it makes people feel guilty for thinking for themselves. And I can attest to that from just the, the, the vast and uh, every single day. I'm amazed at that. And, and I hadn't appreciated that as, a, as an evil before I, I actually started getting labeled and then people wrote to me. So they did a further study and they questioned people who were, who were uh, claimed the Christian box. They said, do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe in transubstantiation? Do you believe in this? No, 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 no. Why do you call yourself Christian? Because I like to think of myself as a good person. And I think most people call themselves Christians because they think if they don't, they're, they're, they'll be labeled as bad people. What is the greatest misreception that exists in the public mind about atheism? Oh, there's lots of them. Um, <laughs> that's, I, I would say the greatest misconception about atheism is that we're not nice people. Um, I, I think that a lot of people think that morality comes from religion. Uh, religion teaches that morality comes from religion and therefore if you don't have religion you don't have morality so I think the greatest misconception of atheism is that we're not nice and or immoral which of course cannot be the case uh, it cannot be the case because all the data combats that um, the population of people who are non-religious in this country depending on your polls goes somewhere between 15 and 30 percent the population of atheists or non-religious people in federal prisons is 0.07%. 0.07 of 1%. So the, the amount of people, the amount of atheists who are committing crimes is tiny compared to the amount of atheists out there. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at it from a morality perspective, from an, from an outside perspective, you can see what's happening. People change churches for a reason. They change churches because they don't agree with the church they're in. If they don't agree with the church they're in, so they, they say, okay, well, this, this church isn't doing something, it's not striking my moral fancy. I'm going to go to this church over here because it does. Well, that means morality is independent of religion. And then what they do is they go to this church over here that says, okay, your morality is correct, and God says so. And then they say, ah, oh, God gives me my morality. Right, uh, and that's that's it's kind of backwards, but that's how the that's how it works. Um, the reality is that every single human picks their own morality. Uh, morality is relative, um, and everybody picks it. Everybody chooses it. The only difference between an atheist and a theist is that an atheist will internalize it and say, "This is my morality," and a theist will say, "This is my morality because I get it from my religion." Do you give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature. That's, that's what that is. And I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. 
you're one of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on Earth. So to even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things and you want to stay religious or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you'd say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally. They meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. Islam is not a religion of peace, and I woke up to the facts on the 11th of September 2001. Perhaps I should have woken up to the facts earlier, but I admit that I did that then at that time. Talking to people of my faith, Islam, and my friends, and discussing with them, I remember all kinds of fallacious arguments, but I remember one consistent thing, and that was to exempt Islam from any criticism. It was culture, it wasn't Islam. But a religion is born in a culture, and if that culture is not peaceful, then that religion is not peaceful. I was told it's politics. We've heard it tonight many times. It's not the religion. But Islam not only has a pious dimension, but it also has a political dimension, a complex system of laws, a political philosophy on how society should be organized. And if you look at that political system, it's anything but peaceful. What emancipated me from the order to submit my will completely to Allah, which in practice means the concentration of power in the hands of a few, was to learn to think critically, the enlightenment. Vote against this motion and open up the flows of Islam for debate in order that Muslims, those who are not yet emancipated, may take charge of their own reason, of their own faculty. Vote against the motion that Islam is a religion of peace and toss, toss that fallacy into the trash can of history. Thank you. Thank you. I am Hussein Ali. All right. A thousand years ago, uh, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. Europe was busy disemboweling heretics at the time. Baghdad was open to all thought at the time between A.D. 800 and 1100, around there. If you look at the advances that unfolded in that period, in that location, it includes uh, the, the, the invention of algebra. Algebra is an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Two-thirds of the stars in the night sky that have names have Arabic names. How does that happen? Just what, Where did the naming rights come from? It came from the fact that at that time, huge advances in the Middle East, in Baghdad in particular, um, was uh, unfolded in engineering, mathematics, especially mathematics, astronomy, navigation, um, uh, physiology. And you say, well, why is that so? If you look at what was going on, they were open to all lines of thought. Jews, Muslims, Christians. There were doubters back then. Today we would call them atheists. They would all come around a table and share ideas. If you have some philosophy that's got holes in it, someone's going to find it. And you're going to challenge you on those ideas. And what happens is the conversation ratchets up. You discard what doesn't work and you keep what does. And when you do that, you make discoveries and you make discoveries rapidly. And at the time, 
that period drew to a close. If you read history books, they'll typically describe sort of the, the sacking of Baghdad. It was a bad time for the city. And they say, oh, it all came to an end. However, the Islamic culture rose at other times later. And in those other times, science and engineering discoveries were not a part of it. So he asked, what, why not? You got the cultural heritage, why doesn't it show up again? And then you got to dig a little deeper from the sacking of Baghdad and you find out there was a, a Muslim cleric, Al-Ghazali was his name, who was to Islam what St. Augustine was to Christianity. St. Augustine kind of laid out the rules for how to be a good Christian at the time. A lot of people were practicing it in their own way. He codified it. He was a religious scholar, figured it out according to his own read, told everybody how to behave, there's the book. You follow this, you're a good Christian. Al-Ghazali said, you follow this, you're a good Muslim. In that text included the assertion, which gained influence socially, but then politically, so then it had power of influence. In there was the assertion that mathematics and the manipulation of numbers was the work of the devil. The entire enterprise collapsed and never recovered. It has not recovered since. If you look at the number of Muslims who have won the Nobel Prize in the sciences, it's one. Number of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize, one-fourth of all Nobel Prizes in science have been won by Jews. How many Muslims in the world? 1.3 billion. How many Jews in the world? 15 million tops. So you look at what effect the culture of discovery and learning can have on what you discover about the natural world. It's extraordinary. I'm going to start off with a thought experiment. Imagine you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. You're a tiny little Australopithecine afarensis, little brain. Your name is Lucy. <clears throat> Thank you. A lot of people in the Midwest don't get that. <clears throat> <laughs> Evolution? <laughs> what? <laughs> Not that Lucy, the other one. Uh, and, you're, uh, and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator? Or is it just the wind? If you think that the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator, and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a type 1 error in cognition, you've, a false positive. You thought the wind was connected to something, and it wasn't. A was connected to B, and it wasn't. Uh, so that's a false positive. But that's relatively harmless. But if you think that the rustle in the grass uh, is just the wind, and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, you're lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. <laughs> and we are the descendants of those who are most likely to make type 1 errors, false positives, versus type 2 errors, false negatives. That is to say, why can't you just stay in the grass and collect enough data to get the answer right? And the answer is that predators don't wait around for prey animals to collect more data. That's why they stalk and sneak up on their prey animals, so they can't get enough data. So we evolved the propensity to make snap decisions and make one kind of error more likely than another kind of error. And that kind of error, that false positive, that's superstition. That's magical thinking. That's assuming A is connected to B. It's a true pattern, and it isn't, and you're wrong. That's the basis of finding false patterns like God's. Now, what's the difference between the wind and a dangerous predator? The wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. And his intention is to eat me, and that can't be good. So what we also do, in, in, in addition to finding these meaningful patterns, is infuse in them agency. That, that is, it's alive, it's real, it has intention, and its intention is not good, so I better assume it's real. And this is the basis of animism and spiritism and polytheism and monotheism and the belief in angels and aliens and demons and spirits and poltergeists and gods. Gods are invisible agents who run the world, who control things, who create these patterns, who are these patterns that we use to explain things. All cultures everywhere in the world have created god beliefs. Gods with these intentional uh, uh, that are intentional agents. Fundamentalists have actually read the books and they're right about them. These books are every bit as intolerant, every bit as divisive as the Osama bin Ladens of the world or the Jerry Falwells of the world suggest.
and I'm not necessarily equating the two of them in moral terms. Once we dignify those claims, we are really hostage to their contents. I mean, the creator of the universe does hate homosexuals. If you read the Bible, at the very least, homosexual men, gay sex, is an abomination. It, it is spelled out in Leviticus. It is, it, this edict is ramified in Romans. It's, you can take Jesus and half his moods and get some really beautiful ethical precepts like the golden rule. But Jesus also said things like in Luke 19, anyone who doesn't want me to, to reign over him, bring him before me and slay him before me. Okay? I guarantee you that the inquisitors of the Middle Ages who were burning heretics alive for five solid centuries, they, they had read the whole New Testament. They had read the Sermon on the Mount. They found some way to square their behavior with, with the ministry of Jesus. Think about this. If life was designed, functional complexity of the cell is amazing. The eye is amazing. Look at it. Like if you saw a watch on the floor, on the, how did it get there? It had to be, have a designer. Because your premise is that functional complexity cannot spontaneously all by itself come into existence. It had to be designed by you know, a, a watch is probably designed by a company and it has a history of trial and error and, and, and multiple designers, mo many of whom are dead, let's say. But in any event, you say, how did that get there? It had to be designed by something even more complex, more fascinating. Anything that is complex enough to define like a watch or a human being or an eyeball has to be at least as complex or more complex than it. If it is true, think about this. This is very important in my migration away from faith. If it is true that functional complexity requires a designer, then the mind of a god also requires a designer. Isn't the mind of a god beautiful? Doesn't it function? Isn't it complex? Doesn't he have desires? Doesn't he have plans? Isn't he this amazing big, is he just a big blob of random nothingness? Or is he an amazingly organized genius of a beautiful wise being up there? That complexity by the argument of design also would require a designer.